Hi, my name is Doug Rieside, and I'm the Digital Curator for the Performing Arts at New York Public Library. I'm going to try to answer all three questions in one response, uh, talking about an experience that I had in 2000 when I studied abroad in Europe. Now, when I left for Europe, it was impressed upon me by both the study abroad office and my relatives that I was going off on a once-in-a-lifetime experience, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. My family had never traveled outside the United States before, and I had no confidence that I would ever do so again, and so I was determined to see everything there was to see. I went to every museum and uh, would pay visits to the, the Mona Lisa, to the Elgin Marbles, to all of Monet's water lilies, until one day, while walking through the Musée d'Orsay and ticking off the 16th water lily, it sort of occurred to me that this was all kind of silly. Um, the paintings in front of me were impressive, of course, but it occurred to me that I, I'd seen them before at the mall, and to my untrained eye, they were really indistinguishable from the prints that I could pull up even at that time on the internet. I decided at that point to save my pounds and pence and head to a West End show whenever I got back to London. Now this is, I think, this experience is, I think, uh, representative, representative of a lot of people of the younger generation. Uh, we have been raised to expect interactivity. For us, a text is not uh, meant to be a linear thing that you read from start to finish, but the, a, a circuitous journey that you follow through links and retreats through the back button. We might watch a movie, or I might watch a movie on a plane, uh, or I might watch a TV show while working out on the treadmill, but I'm much more likely to want to play an interactive video game, and from the diversity and number of people I see playing Angry Birds on the subway platform, I suspect I am not alone. Museums must uh, reform themselves to, or must respond to this new uh, expectation for interactivity. The best thing that museums have had to offer in the past is the opportunity to see something that you just don't see every day, along with some explanatory text and to sort of contextualize the, the object to tell you why it's important. Today, though, most of these items, most uh, important artifacts, can be found, at least in photographic form, on the internet. And as technology improves, it's likely that the distance between the digital surrogate and the original will begin to close, uh, to the point that, to most people, they might actually be indistinguishable. What museums have to offer instead is, are, are really uh, two things. First, there's a lot of stuff they haven't yet digitized that they, have, that they can kind of uncover and recover from the archives and uh, present in the best way possible. And this is one thing that museums should obviously be doing right now. The other thing that they can do, though, is provide a social space uh, in carefully designed sets to create experiences. Now, my best example of this is the Civil Rights Museum in Birmingham, Alabama, which I visited, visited in 2003. Now, at that time, after you watched a, a short film to introduce you to the space, the film became uh, trans. Uh, the, the lighting uh, uh, on the screen um, changed to reveal that the, the film, the movie screen, was actually a scrim that uh, then lifted up and revealed the set that had just been projected on the screen. And the audience was asked to walk up the stairs and onto the set and begin their journey through the, the narrative space of the museum. Now, along the way, uh, technology assisted, but did not interpose itself in a very flamboyant sort of way. You could select oral histories from a touch screen or, or look at letters through a kind of digital page turner. And it, what's interesting is that these are actually the only artifacts I actually remember from the, uh, from the museum. I don't actually remember any of the originals under glass. I'm sure they were there. This is, I think, a model for museums in the future, to find ways of creating spaces and experiences, perhaps assisted by technology, um, that just can't be experienced anywhere else. Now, the artifacts themselves might be shared, um, and shared uh, much more actively and openly than they were in the past. You might put QR codes on the placards and allow people to, to scan them into their phone and share them with uh, their friends or their family when they get home. But the actual experience of going to the museum, of walking through a carefully designed set is something that museums uh, are uniquely capable of offering. Now, this requires, to build museums like this and to build exhibits like this, uh, requires a special sort of skill set that might not be found on uh, traditional museums, uh, on the staff of a traditional museum. You need a kind of a hybrid curator, uh, someone who has both a, real, a, a really deep uh, and passionate expertise um, and, and interest in, the uh, subject matter, but also a practical skill. Now, the practical skill might take a number of different forms. You might be a, a set designer able to construct the, the sort of physical space that I was telling, talking about. 
It might be a graphic designer or a computer programmer, but regardless, you need some sort of ability to construct an experience that communicates not just through words, but also through space and, um, and, and digital technology. Now, you might find the, that your staff at the museum already has a lot of, this, uh, a lot of these sorts of people um, already. If you look in the IT shop, for instance, you might find people that uh, are willing to accept uh, salaries much below the market rate of a usual IT uh, person because they're passionate about the material that they get to work with. And these might be exactly the sort of people that you need to create your next exhibits. You might also find that museum curators have uh, expertise that they're um, usually unable to use, but if given the permission, might use very actively and very effectively. I also think that we might look to the, uh, the graduate students that are not now coming out of uh, programs with digital humanities credentials and are looking for jobs. These people, I think, are uniquely qualified to take custody of the cultural heritage and pass it on to future generations. Thank you.